The following is a Michigan sesquicentennial year presentation. Michigan Outdoors is made possible in part by a grant from the Stroh Brewery Company, who also bring you Stroh's and Stroh Light, fire brewed for smoother taste. This is what we call a northern Michigan deer yard, a cedar swamp, an area where the deer congregate in the middle of the winter to find enough food. The loggers have been through here. The deer are reaching for the twigs and the branches and the leaves that have been knocked down. Now, that was a tough winter a year ago. This past winter has been a banner year for deer. It's been easy for them. We're going to have a big deer herd, which is going to present some problems next year. We're going to talk about that. Stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From forest lies encased in Arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees Listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in this state of Michigan Driving down many of the back roads, well, even some of the main roads in the Upper Peninsula, the main activity you're going to find is logging. Stacks of cut timbers waiting to be hauled, heavy machinery working here and there to clear trails or drag logs that the woodcutters have felled. We put the Bronco on four-wheel drive and explored some of the logging country in the central UP. Now, this was taped last winter, February. Remember that weather? Boy, I tell you, long, cold nights. We found the deer midday in the open, eating the tops of trees freshly cut by the loggers. How were these deer doing? Well, the big question midwinter is always one of food. Is there enough food to go around? It all depends on the weather. And the people who know the situation best are the ones who are in the woods day in and day out. To the loggers working in cedar swamps, deer are a common sight, especially when food is short. And DNR biologists in the north keep a check on the deer herd. Bob Garner and I spent a day last year with Earl Carey from Hardwood in the UP. Earl is one of the best deer hunters in the north. He says because he cuts wood year round, he knows deer, where they live, how they move, and when. And DNR biologist Bob Depker has been tracking the movements of these deer in the deer yards. How is it that you're cutting here? Well, what is the... Well, I, see, I'm a contract logger for Mead Paper Corporation. Oh, I and see. I've been logging for them since about 1975. Now, is this Mead's land or yeah. state land? Uh, formerly, this was uh, Sawyer and Stoll land, and then Mead bought it. But I've been working in this general area now since 1951. Hmm. And uh, since that time, we've had deer yard here every, every winter. Uh, for the first, oh, the first two or three winters in 50, there weren't too many. But then from that time on, they got used to us being here. And uh, we, every winter we have from 600 to 1,000 deer here then. Hmm. Well, Bob, how is the DNR involved in this? Well, at this particular cutting, we are collaring deer to determine uh, how far deer move into this area from summer range into this winter range and then disperse in the spring back into summer range. So our collaring data indicates that uh, deer have moved from as far as 35 miles north. 35 miles? from Marquette wow. County and as far as 20 miles west, uh, northwest into this mm. area. Is this a, a natural wintering area, a natural deer yard with the cedar swamp? Uh, or isn't there as much cedar here as I see? Oh yeah, there's, there's cedar scattered throughout the area, that's why the deer are mm -hmm. here. The cedar provides uh, thermal cover, it moderates temperature extremes and cuts down wind movement, so the deer have a better chance of surviving here. As we drove in, you saw that or didn't see deer tracks in the uh, hardwood areas that mm -hmm. were clear cut. Uh, deer need some conifer during the uh, winter period. They to need the pines for the wind protection. Primarily cedar and hemlock to provide uh, protection from wind and cold temperatures. No. Earl's crews pay attention to cutting trees for the deer, making sure they cut daily and spread out the cuts over a large geographic area. And many of these deer depend on the loggers. Looks like a lot of deer food coming down here, but it's not going to last long. That'll feed them for a little while. Oh yeah, yeah that's for sure. Uh, there'll be a bunch here in just a few minutes. How long uh, will it take for them to strip that tree? Oh, about 20 minutes. About 20 minutes if we were no one here. These deer know Earl. They know their survival depends on sticking close to the whining of his chainsaws. Now you don't see many big, healthy deer during the day. 
This middle of the day whitetail groups are the ones that are in the poorest condition. The landowner on this area put out potatoes to try to help the deer over the hump. But potatoes, like many types of food, don't provide deer with everything they need to survive. We found two dead deer within 100 yards of the potato piles. They didn't starve because most of them have food in their stomachs. The problem is malnutrition, not enough of the right kind of food. Anytime you find aspen or any kind of twigs this size that have been eaten by deer, you know those deer are in trouble. There's so much woody fiber in these pencil-sized branches that it's, it's negative nutrition. Their bodies spend more energy chewing and trying to digest these branches than they get from the twigs once they're digested. The deer would be better off not trying to eat this food at all. So when they're not getting the nutrition they need, even though their stomachs are full, they become weak. Their bodies know they're in trouble. They drop their guard. They wander around in the middle of the day, constantly looking for food. And the deer with the worst nutrition lose their fears of being eaten. They let animals and man come close. Just watch how close I get before they spook. These are wild deer. They're not tame deer. During the summer, the landowner says he sees very few. It's only at this time of year when the young deer, the weak deer, are visible all day long. Remember that cedar that we saw cut earlier in the day? Earl Carey said it would last about 20 minutes. Well, here it is. Everything within reach is gone. These precious cedar twigs and leaves went to good use, though. The deer that ate them got the best nutrition they could get in the winter. Now, the tape you've just been watching was taken last winter, which was rough. But this winter, well, it's been a breeze. Starvation or malnutrition is minimal. So do we have a worry for our deer herd? You bet we do. Reproduction this spring will be high, probably record levels. Next winter, even if it's average, it's going to be tough on the deer herd. Cedar swamps are bound to be crowded with deer, and many of the young ones won't make it. Unless hunters put a large number of deer in the freezer this fall, this winter's good fortune spells bad fortune for many of these deer when next winter rolls around. It may sound cruel, but it's the balance of nature in Michigan outdoors. Seems like the only place in the state we've had much riding activity is in the middle part of the Upper Peninsula. According to Dick's favorite sports, the deer have been walking around, even though there's 14 inches of snow up there right now. They did have a big flurry of northern pike activity right at the end of the season. Root Cellar had some good perch activity at the end of the walleye season. He says there's good ice, 10 inches of snow, light pressure, but the perch are there to be had. 10 and 11 inches of new snow at Bayshore Resort around this part of Menominee County. Caught a 12 and a half pound walleye last day of the season up there. Perch fishing is improving. At Hulbert, 60 deer are being fed at that little deer yard. 10 inches of new snow. They expect they'll have a few more moving in. Harry's place, well, Harry Reinfelder says, winter's finally arrived. They've been waiting for it now that the walleye season is over. Mid-March to mid-April, he expects that perch, fish, perch fishing is going to be improving continually. We got five inches of new snow in this part of the northern lower. Ace Hardware says action has been medium to slow. Few crappies and gills in some of the inland lakes, according to Adrian's around Rogers City. Got eight inches plus over there of new snow. Wellman Sports Center at the Asabo River says all the way up to Foot Dam, it's great for steelhead and browns. They're catching perch at Augre. Hardly any snow, not enough to mention. Alberta Sports Shop says that the Betsy and the Platt doing real good for a nice steelhead. Emil Dean backs that up. He says the steelhead are starting to do their thing, moving on to the beds. Although in the southwest, BJ Sporting Goods around South Haven says it's been spotty, quite slow. Uh, up at the dam on the St. Joe River is where they've had the best action, but it has been slow. Panfish is good around Anchor Bay, but very dangerous ice, according to B&G Sports Shop. No snow, no fishermen sums it up right there. And uh, Harlow's on the bay says the ice is bad and dangerous. They have been getting some crappies at Wixom Lake. Get out on one of those lakes, catch yourself a big one, and put your name in the trophy book. Here's a great photo of a nice 11-point buck taken in Washtenaw County last season by Randy Cornell from Milan. You know, Grand Traverse Bay produces a lot of these fish for anglers, but this 31-inch, 9.5-pound lake whitefish came from Lake Superior off Marquette County. Dave Labonte from Marquette caught it on a single egg the first week in April last year. 
Crawford Lake in Kent County produced this 10-inch, one-pound, one-ounce bluegill for little Jimmy Blazik from Comstock Park. Caught it on a night crawler, and that's a trophy worth bragging about, along with Walt Gilmore's sixth largest Great Lakes muskie from 1985. 30 pounds, nine ounces, and at last year's Stroh's Fishing Awards banquet, he had some good things to say about fishing in Michigan. We were, I'm a walleye fisherman. I got some good walleye buddies out here with me tonight. Uh, the great thing about fishing in Michigan, you don't know what you're gonna catch. We were chugging for walleyes with a minnow, hooked on a chugging outfit, and we'd had an excellent day. We're ready to go home and said, all right, we'll take one more drift. That was the one that did it. Mm. And it was super. It's the thrill of my life. I fished Michigan for 40 years. I remember the days when the walleyes were down to zip. And we should really thank all of those great organizations and you people for and the DNR for bringing back the greatest fishing in the country. You know, all, these, right. all of these states come up here and try to lure all of us to go fishing everywhere. Well, I can tell them we've not only got the most beautiful state, the best fish, we got the best fishermen. You bet. And here's one right here. Walt Gilmore from Berkeley with his 30-pound Great Lakes muskie. Big fish of all species will be at the Stroh's Fishing Awards Banquet this Saturday night in Livonia. More trophies than we've ever had at any other banquet. Tickets will be available at the door. We're going to have room for you, so join us and watch us tape the fish stories you'll be seeing during the coming year in our trophy book. These are exciting times for Michigan sportsmen, and most of us are pretty excited about the prospect of the new Chinese Sichuan bird being introduced. All this week, DNR wildlife biologists have been outfitting the Chinese blackneck pheasants with radio transmitters in preparation for the historic release a week from Monday. The birds' movements will be heavily monitored. The plantings will take place on the Gregory game area near Pinckney. The Flint River chapter of the Michigan Steelheaders rate a big round of applause this week. At their highly successful spring boating and fishing show last Saturday, they made a very generous $350 contribution to Outdoors Forever. The Lost Nations game area near Hillsdale was the recipient last week of wild turkeys from the state of Pennsylvania. Three gobblers and 12 hens were released. Another gobbler or two will be added there this month. By this weekend, most sporting goods stores and bait shops will have the new fishing licenses and fishing guides for 1987. The licenses have gone up in price from nine eight, or two nine eighty five from seven and a quarter. Senior citizen license, though, are still a buck, and April first is the day they go into effect. Too often, all of us are quick to complain, especially when it comes to the legislature. Sportsmen see the legislature as a governmental body that increases hunting and fishing fees. Others simply think all it does is spend money and raise taxes. But doggone it, when it comes to the new poaching laws, the legislature really came through for sportsmen last year. I got a big kick out of a news release last week from the Ohio DNR. Their department was making a big deal out of three guys who were caught with 24 ducks over the limit. The judge Judge fined them $168 and took away their licenses for one year. That was, in my opinion, a slap in the face to the conservation officer and the time it took him to investigate the case. Yet, the Ohio DNR seemed pleased enough to issue a press release. Why, if that had happened in Michigan under our new poaching laws, the yahoos that shot all the ducks would have paid a minimum of $13,000 in fines and costs and probably would have spent some time with the county sheriff. Just recently, a letter to the editor of the Houghton Lake Resorter complained that a deer poacher received a heavier fine and a longer jail stay than an adult who was convicted of burglary and jumping bail. The letter writer was concerned about that, but I see it another way. With mandatory minimum fines and jail sentences, poachers know that stealing game from sportsmen isn't going to be tolerated in Michigan. That's the only message that poachers understand, and in my opinion, that same message should be put into other laws so that crooks from burglars to bank robbers will begin to understand it too. Now that we've completed our hunting awards banquet, 
I'm ready to talk about the scoring system. We had some different opinions this past year, Bob. I had a system which I've used where you hang a, a one-inch ring on a tine, and if it'll support the tine, I said, well, that counts as a point. Now, there are some flaws in this system. Sure. It's simple, but there, there were some flaws that some little squeaker points were getting through that maybe really shouldn't have. We had a lot of sportsmen write and say, why don't we use the Boone and Crockett system? Why don't we use the Safari Club system? Too complex. We have to handle too many deer through, through our awards program. Right. Those systems are standard throughout the country, but they're very complicated and require certified scores. Take a one-inch tube, one-inch long, one-inch in diameter, similar to what you would cut off of a, a film canister. Just cut one inch off of that. Or a piece of pipe. Now when we apply that to, oh, say one of these little bumps on the, uh, around the burr, which would hold a ring, it won't hold that tube. It's got to be at least a half inch, mm -hmm. you know, right there. This would hold a ring easily and get counted as a point, but it is kind of a cheap point. Now that won't hold, and, and also on this rack right here, this looks to be a six-pointer, but no matter how you angle it, you can't get this one-inch tube to stay on, on this particular tine. So, that's the system we're going to go to. Get yourself a one-inch tube. Anybody can score it. That's what we're going to have in 1987 for our Big Buck Award. I think it'll work fine. Sounds good to me, too. We'll give that a try. Now let's see if you folks can answer this question in our outdoor quiz. Polar bears have a different feeding habit than other bear species. What is it? When a polar bear kills its prey, it usually gorges on the fat and leaves the carcass for foxes and other scavengers. Black, brown, and grizzly bears, on the other hand, usually remain near and guard a carcass they're feeding on until it's completely consumed, which may take days. People a lot of times think uh, of a pity trip. These poor people in wheelchairs and so on can't do anything. Do you realize that's not the, the thrust of this Outdoors Forever? Uh, yes, I, I realize that they're a, a group of hunter and fishermen that uh, have a problem that's unique and different from the average hunter and fisherman, and that uh, they're being discriminated and have been over the years, uh, legislatively and uh, through existing laws in the DNR. Former State Senator Kirby Holmes deserves a big commendation from all of us sportsmen who are getting older, have more problems in the outdoors. He didn't, he didn't form his task force on handicap or hunting and fishing concerns out of a publicity stunt. It was for real. It was, this was right after our first Outdoors Forever meeting, Raj, back in April when he came up with this and he and his staff. You were on the committee. Gary Johns, who is with the U.S. Army Tank Automotive Command, mm -hmm. and you became the chairman of this committee. That's correct. How'd you like it? It was a lot of work, but it was enjoyable. Well, it's something that a lot of people had concerns about. We held at our Hunter's Workshop in September, you held for the task force a hearing. And a lot of people came there, a lot of handicappers came and voiced their concerns. How was it? Uh, was, it a, was it a tough job with this task force? Did you encounter apathy, antagonism, fear, or, or what? It was very tough because of the extreme time constraints we had to work under to get the amount of work done. It wasn't so much apathy. We had an extreme amount of interest. But in the past, everything has been so fragmented that the DNR didn't have any adequate input to know what to do. So through the workshop that we held, we got information from the hunters and fishermen of their concerns and possible action that we could take to remedy them. What did you find, Rod, you in the political realm? Right. Well, then we went back to our own meetings and found out, you know, the whole reason we looked at it is because legislation was designed before handicappers started getting access and civil rights and so forth. And looking at that, we thought, well, let's take a look at the laws and put common sense to them from handicappers' input. And that's what came out of it. You never know when you or one of your friends or one of your family is going to have a problem. There was someone representing the general public here, Roger Friend, uh, with the, from the Midland County Sports Fishermen's Association representing the general public and very tragically what happened on Christmas Day? I talked to him and he told me that he had went blind. He had uh, sugar diabetes and didn't know it. I guess his medication has been straightened away and some of his sight has come back but uh, it's not all back yet. It's just something that Man. you never know about. Something just like your boating accident, Rod, right. just all of a sudden to somebody that you wouldn't even expect well, we wish the best to Roger Friend, and hopefully he will recover and make a full recovery. But it's just, it's one of these things that just keeps happening that we're concerned about. You came out with six recommendations in this report from the 
task force. One, you want to investigate the uh, permit to hunt from a standing vehicle was a big concern. A handicapper guide to show access to campground facilities and fishing areas. You want to see a videotape produced so that uh, people can understand a little better about the recreation related to handicap. Someone on the DNR staff to oversee handicapper concerns, which hasn't been done. They've no. given no thought to it, really. Barrier-free access is a big problem so that people can get to piers and to the outdoor areas. And crossbows. There we have a hot one. That was probably the hottest topic that you covered? It was. Right. Well, without getting into all the detail, this report on the Senate Task Force of Handicapper Hunting and Fishing will sort of be the blueprint of things to come that we're going to follow up in Outdoors Forever. Gary, you did a great job, and this is just phase one, right? Phase one. Now we have to make sure that they're all enacted. If you're interested in this, write to us. Our address will be coming up in a few minutes, and we will be happy to send you this full report from the Senate Task Force. This Saturday night is going to be a big one for anglers. We have more trophy fish mounts than have ever been assembled at one time in Michigan on display at our 6th Annual Stroh's Fishing Awards Banquet. Our cameras will be there taping the fishing stories for our TV trophy book. Tickets are available and will be available at the door. Give us a call if you have any questions. Hope to see you there. Also on Saturday night, there will be a Pheasants Forever Banquet in Grand Blanks, sponsored by the Genesee County Chapter. During the day Saturday, you can attend a fly fishing clinic and tackle display at the high school in Rockford. And the annual Bluebird Festival and Wildlife Art Show will be in full swing both Saturday and Sunday at the Jackson Community College in Jackson. Sunday, there will be a gun show, buy, sell, and trade at the Capital Area Sportsman's League in Lansing. And the same day, you'll find the Steelheader Spring Sport Fishing Show in Cass City. Because of the popularity, there's a pre-registration deadline for the annual turkey hunting workshop in East Lansing. Get your reservations in by March 14th if you want to attend the workshop on the 21st. Next Thursday, make sure you tune in to our live cook-off here on PBS. The 10 best fish and wild game recipes of 1987 will be taste tested by our panel, headlined by none other than the original Mr. Michigan Outdoors, Mort Neff. Let's talk about recipes in the old days. Let's talk about them. In the old lumber camps, do you suppose they ever had anything like this? I don't know. Would anyone on the panel know? Amo? I wasn't old enough to be there. <laughs> I read about days like You read about it? Yeah. So, what about it, Mort? Well, I think probably they had them. I don't, don't think they had the distinctive flavors that we've had here tonight. If they did, I'd like to be a lumberjack. You would? Oh, yeah. What, That'd be great. What are you spending your time doing now? You're, I happen to know, close to 80, give or take three or four years. Which side? <laughs> No, you, my, you just I had spending? a birthday in December. What am I spending my yeah. time at? I get that question. Worrying about what's coming next on this recipe. Is that right? It's a live one-hour special next Thursday. Don't miss it. Jot down the date on our Outdoors Club fishing workshop, Saturday, April 4th at Okemos. Details coming up next week. And the fifth annual outdoor fair is causing a stampede of reservations for accommodations at Houghton Lake. If you want to spend the weekend, it's time to firm up your plans. And if you missed a number, the Michigan Travel Bureau will give it to you toll-free. That's 1-800-5432-YES. Suzanne Rakovitz from Muskegon, you came very, very close to being a finalist in our Fish and Wild Game cooking contest. Your honey venison stir-fry, I think, is yes. Sounds real world. sweet. Ooh. Oh, it's delicious. Absolutely delicious. And not that all, not the difficult No, to it make. isn't. Like I say, it sounds like it's real sweet. You got venison loin, you could use steak here, and honey, and that's what's going to give it your sweet. Boy, it sure is. And the soy sauce, now, we'll kind of counteract with the honey a little bit. I don't taste the soy no, sauce. No, you can't. The cornstarch for thickening, some bouillon cubes, water chestnuts, which you usually find in a stir fry, some peanuts, which is different, and pea pods. This is some very properly wrapped venison here. I took a lot of care in that. <laughs> you should. You did a very good job. And with every slice, knowing that another piece is going to be gone instead of take something from <laughs> yeah. me. Oh, boy. You can it's slice good. that into chunks. And then you're going to add some onions here. And they're just chopped. And this can make a marinade. You want this to marinade. You need about a third cup of honey. And, mm. and that really does smell. It. You can oh, taste you can it. smell it during the cooking. Just it just really goes all over. And like I say, the soy sauce will counteract with the honey a little bit. But I don't understand why I'm not tasting that soy sauce. Well, I think the honey is a sweeter mm -hmm. flavor, and will you know go through it faster than the soy sauce will. 
and then your bouillon cubes you want to dissolve in your water. In a separate bowl. That's right. You don't want to add them together. And then you will put your cornstarch in with your water and bouillon cubes. It'll just make it nice, colorful. Cornstarch is interesting stuff. That it white is. Powder it's, that uh, and thickens real quick. And doesn't evidently have any flavor at all itself. No, no, none whatsoever. You can add it to just about anything, and it won't change the flavor of anything. You're gonna fry this, and you want your your pan preheated, and you can almost smell that honey just right there. Just it is good. Now that only has to marinate, uh, Suzanne says, for about an hour. That's right. Now you can marinate it overnight, but I think it'd be too strong. So mm -hmm. by an hour, it, it was just right. Add the thickening, the yep, water chestnuts. And it, that doesn't take very long at all, especially when it's good and hot. Mm -hmm. now your water chestnuts don't get soggy like your potatoes will. They stay good and crisp. And your peanuts, they these, stay the same. These peanuts were in, are interesting in this recipe because they, uh, they end up, well, the pea pods have the brightness to them. That's right. And you add those at the very end so they don't get mushy. But these peanuts look like baked beans, and I'll be darned if they don't taste a little <laughs> like baked beans, do they? Well, yeah, they, with the they honey. Do. They definitely do, with especially the honey with honey on. in there. Yeah. Huh. yeah, you know, but it's not when, I, when looking at the ingredients, you would get the idea that this thing is so sweet mm -hmm. that it would be very rich and sweet. It's not. It's it's really kind of a mild, just sweet, mildly, yeah, yeah mildly now, sweet. This is coming from a guy who used to be known as Mr. Snickers. Snickers. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, that's that's true. <laughs> but I got to tell you, sweet. on a scale of one to ten, this recipe goes right at the eleven mark. Right at the eleven <laughs> oh, mark. This is really and it, great. And it wasn't a finalist, although yeah. we have a lot of elevens, so twelves, and thirteen. Uh, in the yeah, recipe. A lot to look forward to. Well, Suzanne, it's a, a, a tremendous recipe. It a is. tremendous recipe. And uh, I guess I'll get out some more of that venison loin. <laughs> you idea. folks, I hope you do too. And also, try to get out this weekend. It's milder and uh, it's a great place to be. See you next week. It's hard to beat a stir fry recipe, and this one would work well with almost any kind of meat wild game, chicken, or beef. It will be featured in the new edition of Fred Trost's Outdoor Digest, which will be mailed out to Outdoors Club members within two weeks. We'll be glad to send one to you if you're not a member, along with information on joining our Outdoors Club. Just drop us a line at Fred Trost's Outdoors Club, Box 1775, East Lansing, Michigan, 48823-1775. Your copy will be sent to you in two weeks. Reach is gone. These precious cedar twigs and leaves went to good use, though. The deer that ate them got the best nutrition they could get in the winter. Now, the tape you've just been watching was taken last winter, which was rough. But this winter, well, it's been a breeze. Starvation or malnutrition is minimal. So do we have a worry for our deer herd? You bet we do. Reproduction this spring will be high, probably record levels. Next winter, even if it's average, it's going to be tough on the deer herd. Cedar swamps are bound to be crowded with deer, and many of the young ones won't make it. Unless hunters put a large number of deer in the freezer this fall, this winter's good fortune spells bad fortune for many of these deer when next winter rolls around. It may sound cruel, but it's the balance of nature in Michigan outdoors. Michigan Outdoors is made possible in part by a grant from the Stroh Brewery Company, who also bring you Stroh's and Stroh Light, fire brewed for smoother taste.